Hypertension, Chapter 31. This slide is important because we need to know what to teach the community and our patients. So by definition, hypertension is systolic greater than 140 and diastolic greater than 90. It's not just on one time that we take your blood pressure. It's based on an average of two or more accurate BP measurements during two or more contacts with the healthcare provider. So we can see in a perfect world systolic 120 over 80 or thereabouts. Those with prehypertension anywhere from 120 to 139 systolic, 80 to 89 diastolic. Now we get into stage one. The systolic is markedly up 140 to 159 systolic, 90 to 99 diastolic, and stage two greater than a 60 for systolic and greater than 100 diastolic. And it can go much higher than this. But these are the stages that I want you to memorize. Okay, here's some questions. Patients with hypertension are often symptom-free. And that's true. People are walking time bombs. They don't even know what's going on inside their body. Monotherapy, that is one med, is recommended to increase medication compliance when treating hypertension. And that's true. Wouldn't you rather take just one medication? Lifestyle changes slash modifications have not been proven to control hypertension. Well, that one was easy. Don't you wish that was on the test? That's false. Using a blood pressure cuff that's too small will give a lower blood pressure measurement compared to one taken with a properly sized cuff. True or false? Hmm. If you didn't know that, you got to go back to fundamentals. The elderly population is more sensitive to postural hypotension due to impaired cardiovascular reflexes. And that's true. Remember what I said? A lot of people have hypertension. They don't know it. That's why we call it the silent killer. So there's two different types here. Primary, also known as essential, that's high blood pressure from an unidentified cause. We just don't know why you have high blood pressure. Or secondary hypertension has a specific cause. So about, according to your book, 67 million adults, that's 31% of the population have hypertension. That's one in every three adults. Only about half, like 47% of people with hypertension, have their condition under control. Nearly one in three American adults have prehypertension, Remember, that's the blood pressure numbers that are higher than normal, but have yet to go into those other two categories. And it costs like up to $47.5 billion every year. So that includes the cost of health care services, medications to treat the blood pressure, and missed days of work. I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, this patho piece, but if you dissect it, it's very clear. So let's just even look at the left side. Excess sodium, you, you eat a lot of sodium, right? And then you're going to retain, right? So when you eat something salty, then you're going to retain fluids. So that's going to increase your fluid volume, which is going to be harder on your heart. It's going to increase the preload. And then that whole auto-regulation process starts where there's going to be more peripheral, peripheral resistance. So if you go through each one of those, because blood pressure is a product of cardiac output times the peripheral resistance. Remember, that's the product of heart rate times stroke volume. Each time the heart contracts, the pressure is transferred from the contraction of the heart muscle to the blood, and then the pressure is exerted by the blood as it flows through the blood vessels. Hypertension can result from increases in cardiac output, increases in peripheral resistance, which is the constriction of the blood vessels, or both. Increases in cardiac output are often related to an expansion of vascular volume. So it's a multifactorial condition. It's not just one thing. For hypertension to occur, there has to be a change in one or more factors that affect peripheral resistance or cardiac output. In addition, there's a problem with the body's control systems that regulate it because the body typically does try to regulate it, and so that's why we say it's a multifactorial condition. So some of the possible causes of hypertension are increased sympathetic nervous system activity, and that's related to the dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, or an increased renal reabsorption of sodium chloride and water, and that could be a genetic variation where the kidneys handle sodium. It could be an increased activity of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, 
And if that's occurring, that results in expansion of the extracellular fluid volume and increased systemic vascular resistance. It can also be because of decreased vasodilation of the arterioles related to dysfunction of the vascular endothelium or resistance to insulin, and that's a common factor linking hypertension to uh, type 2 diabetes, and then obesity and glucose intolerance goes with that, or finally the activation of adaptive components of the immune response, and that contributes to renal inflammation and dysfunction. Well, so what are some of the major risk factors? Smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, the kidneys aren't working, you're overweight, you're not moving around, increased age, and genetics. The target organ damage in cardiovascular disease that, that goes hand in hand with this, heart disease, person will get an MI, and they're, hyp they're very hypertensive, they're prone to a stroke. Hypertension also means a person's kidneys are taxed, so they can get chronic kidney disease, peripheral artery disease, and eye problems, retinopathy. So when a person consumes a cigarette, they're consuming all of these things. Um, cadmium, like that's in batteries, candle wax, industrial solvent, insecticide, toilet cleaner, paint, rocket fuel, poison, sewer gas, vinegar, and lighter fluid. Kind of mind-boggling. So we begin our assessment with the history and physical, and then what labs would you anticipate for this patient? the urinalysis, the blood ch chemistry, and cholesterol. So that would include, the, we want to know what the sodium level is, the potassium level, the BUN and the creatinine, their glucose level, and their cholesterol panel. HDL, high-density lipoprotein, LDL, low-density lipoprotein, and what's their total cholesterol level. We also want to put them on an EKG or ECG to assess for left ventricular failure. Okay, so we've identified that the person has a higher than normal blood pressure. Well, if they don't, then just come back in two years. But if they do have any one of these stages, prehypertension, stage one, or stage two, what do we do? For prehypertension, you know, we just maybe give them some literature, kind of see if they can implement some lifestyle changes and recheck in one year. Stage one, we need to have them come back no more later than two months. And stage two, we're going to be looking, a very close look at that later on in this chapter, we need to evaluate and treat immediately. So you see the little side disclaimer on here, know this slide. Okay, here's some questions. Hypertension is defined as the systolic and diastolic BP greater than blank, blank, based on the average of two or more accurate BP measurements. Hopefully you said 140 over 90. The recommended initial medication regimen or regime for patients with uncomplicated hypertension includes blank and beta blockers or both. Diuretics. We haven't got to that, but we will. So there's a lot of teaching for this patient, and it begins with weight reduction, maintaining a normal body weight, that BMI 18.5 to 24.9 uh, kilograms. Um, let's see, the reduced alcohol intake and, for example, uh, no more than 24 ounces of beer, 10 ounces of wine, or 3 um, ounces of 80-proof whiskey, if you, I know you know nothing of all this, per day in most men, and less than one drink a day in women and lighter weight people. Reduce sodium intake. You're absolutely going to anticipate this, this person's going to be on a 2-gram sodium diet in the hospital, and you're going to re recommend less than or equal to 2.4 grams sodium when they're at home. Regular physical activity, that's regular aerobic physical activity like brisk walking. And you're going to include in the plan of care the um, diet, high in fruits, vegetables, and low-fat dairy. What else can I say? The DASH diet. What is that? It's the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So that's the consumption of a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and low-fat dairy with reduced content of saturated and total fat. You know I have to throw in a couple of questions here. Blank hypertension can occur if hypertensive medications are suddenly stopped. Well, since we haven't gone over this, what well, we did in class, the answer is rebound. So 
if somebody's on the rebound, right? So rebound hypertension can occur if hypertensive meds are suddenly stopped. So if you stop it, then the blood pressure is going to go up and then down, then up and then down. Hypertensive urgency is a situation in which blood pressure is very elevated, but there's no evidence of impending target organ damage. And that's what we're going to talk about very shortly. But first, before we talk about anything else, we're going to be talking about the meds. You have a list on Blackboard of some of the meds I've typed up just for your convenience. You haven't had farm yet, but it feels like it, right? So you can see that I went ahead and made a little key for you. The T-H-I-A-Z is thiazide diuretics. We've got angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. We call those ACE inhibitors. ARBs is angiotensin receptor blockers the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and aldosterone antagonists. So I do want you to be fairly familiar with the farm side of the medications that are used for this patient. So describe teaching principles that you would impart to someone on a beta blocker who may experience postural hypotension. Now before you say, well, I don't know anything about this, where you're going to be caring for patients and you are caring for patients in the hospital and they're going to be getting beta blockers, so you do need to know this. So you want to teach the person on a beta blocker to change position slowly when moving from lying or sitting. C counsel elderly patients to use supportive devices to prevent falls. And lifestyle changes need to be discussed, increasing fluids only if it's not contraindicated avoiding alcohol, the exercise programs that are safe for them, remember they have to consult the physician first, and avoid walking during hot weather. The patient will be given a diuretic, a beta blocker, or both. The medications are gradually increased, so if the person goes back after one med, maybe a week later and we measure the blood pressure and it hasn't changed or it's worse, then they're going to increase or add something to that. Multiple medications are often needed to control blood pressure and we want to make sure that they're maintaining those lifestyle changes as well. So the thiazide diuretics, there's multiple, but I've given you one example of each could be diurel, loop diuretic, you know that's the easiest one, that's Lasix, a potassium sparing. So often when we give a loop diuretic, remember it depletes the potassium. If you give a potassium sparing diuretic like spironolactone, it does not. Kozar is an example of an aldosterone receptor blocker. So a central alpha-2 agonist and other central acting drugs might be exampled by Aldamet, Catapress, Clonidine, beta blockers, remember those are the olols, that's atenolol, esmolol, metoprolol, propanolol, okay, not always, but again, you want to watch for postural hypotension for that patient. And the beta blockers with intrinsic sympatho sympathomimetic activity, say that three times after you've recorded so many lectures. That's a group of beta blockers that are able to stimulate the beta adrenergic receptors and to oppose the stimulating effects of catecholamines in a competitive way. And one example might be uh, Sectrol, S-E-C-T-R-A-L. And finally, the alpha and beta blockers, that would be Cardura or Minipress. So again, you're going to have to start looking at the classifications and memorize some of the names of these medications. But what do I want you to really know on this slide? Watch for postural hypotension when people are on beta blockers. So if they, they may be dizzy when they get up and they're risk for fall. Examples of vasodilators are going to be your nitroglycerin, apresoline perhaps, ACE inhibitors. Examples of those are going to be the prills, captopril. Lysinopril, um, Benazapril, not always, but again, you know, you've got to figure out some way to, and you have to know both names. So, Captopril is Capitan, Enalopril is Vasotec, Lysinopril is Prinavil. So, angio two, Angiotensin II two antagonists, those are the ARBs, are exampled by 
Losartan, which is Kozar, or Candesartan, which is Atacand, maybe Benacar might be in that category. Calcium channel blockers, that's your M. Lodipine, which is Norvasc, or Diltiazem, which is Cardizem, and one that I've given quite frequently is Nifedipine, which is Procardia. So which of the following vasodilators is used to treat hypertension? Don't worry, it will get easier. The answer is Tridel. It produces peripheral vasodilation by relaxation of smooth muscles. So the patient with BP issues, you need to start with a history. What's their lifestyle? What are their risk factors? Do they have target organ damage? Are their kidneys functioning? How's their heart? What kinds of signs and symptoms do they manifest? Do they have shortness of breath, chest pain, altered speech, their vision changes, nosebleeds, headaches, dizziness, balance problems, nocturia, there's a lot. Cardiovascular, check their apical and peripheral pulses. And then also look at other factors that may influence the condition of their treatment. Now this slide is very self-explanatory. What I will add to this is just basically saying that not everybody can afford all these medications. And so you're, you're thinking, oh, they're non-compliant. Well, it may be more than that. So you do need to look deeper. If they're not taking their meds, then find out why and don't presume or judge them. So the interventions are teaching, not judging, helping them to adhere to the treatment regimen, maybe getting them some referrals or some support groups if that's, if that's indicated, follow-up care, making sure they meet with their physician, control, can't be cured, right? Although if a person's really borderline, they can really well control it just by making some dietary changes. If it's genetic, we can still work on controlling it. Reinforce and support those lifestyle changes, and it is a lifelong process. Like I indicated, just because someone's not taking their meds does not necessarily mean it's always going to be non-compliance in the realm that you're thinking of. It could be financial issues or transportation issues. So try to not judge and get to the bottom of everything instead. And you want to include the family, and you know maybe they can't. They're they're not taking the right. Um, strength because they got the bottles confused. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into this. So, and remember that monotherapy is a lot easier to take one pill, but not everybody can. The last few slides have to do with hypertensive emergency and urgency. These are very important concepts. So, hypertensive crisis. When we talk about the emerg hypertensive emergency, the BP is really high. And not only is it high, greater than 180 over 120, but it involves target organ damage. So the kidneys are infected and other organs as well. If it is, so here, here you see I have, remember that hypertensive emergency involves target organ damage. Hypertensive urgency, it's still high, but you're not seeing the same type of organ damage. So in the emergent phase, we need to do something immediately. Reduce the BP 25% in the first hour. Why don't we bring it down all of a sudden? Remember, we don't want that rebound effect to occur. We reduce it over a period of hours. Reduce it to at least 160 over 100, and even that can cause a stroke over six hours. Then gradually get it down over a period of days. The exceptions are if the person has an ischemic stroke and or an aortic dissection. And so medications we'll see for this patient will include the vasodilators, nitroprusside, nicardipine, enalapril, and nitro. And you want to be frequently monitoring the BP and they're going to be an EKG because you're monitoring cardiovascular status. So as I said, you see, did you see that flicker up there? Okay. Reduce the BP 25% in the first hour. Remember, we don't get it down really, really quick, okay? 
Now, if we're looking more that the blood pressure is really high, but there's no organ damage, that's the urgency we want to be monitoring. And it could go into that emergency, so we want to know that there's a potential for the target organ damage. The medications, we want the fast-acting oral agents, the labetalol, that's a beta blocker, the ACE inhibitor captopril, and the alpha-2 agonist clonidine. Last slide. Your patient has uncontrolled hypertension. What could be a consequence of this disease? It's your favorite. Choose all that apply. So I'm going to give you the answers. If you still need time, pause this slide. And that concludes this chapter.